in that case, let's get this show on the road. We've waited long enough. Okay, on to our studio number two here. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. There you go, you press the share button and bam, everyone can see everything. Awesome. Let's talk about some studios here. Sounds like we need, there's possibly a little section we're gonna slow down at. So as always, to anyone out there, if you have any questions, let me know. Studio review is pretty typically laid back. I'm just gonna be talking my way through studio review, um, how I approach the problems, if that, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, as you also know, this is being recorded, so here we go. Today, we are dealing with 8.6 studio strings in a race. Starting out, strings are ordered collections of characters, as we already know from lecture, which are strings of, which are strings of length one. Okay, I'm already confused. Strings are ordered collections of characters, which are, oh, okay, characters are strings of length one. Yes, all right, thank you. The characters in a string can be accessed using bracket notation. That's right, sure can. Arrays are ordered collections of items, which can be strings, numbers, others, arrays, etc. The items slash elements slash entries stored in an array can be accessed using bracket notation. Ooh, and also, Kyle, you can also test out your live transcript. Bam. And now you can hear my voice and see my voice. Look at that. Double Kyle coming at you. All right. Strings are immutable, whereas arrays can be changed. If anyone was wondering what that sentence particular means, it actually goes to when I said you can make an array constant and still manipulate it, while strings, once they're constant, cannot be changed. So strings are immutable, meaning that once they are set, they cannot be changed, whereas arrays can be changed, they are mutable, as in they can be changed once they've been declared. Their contents can change. The array itself technically stays consistent, but the contents inside of it changes. Think of a shipping container. The shipping container itself never changes, but inside of it, whether it's carrying over your Amazon packages or a pile of puppies, something, hopefully there's not a pile of puppies in that container. Actually, that's a bad example. Regardless, the container itself never changes. We're gonna talk about this more in next lecture about what this actually means, but this is what it's talking about immutable. We can change the contents inside the container, but not the container itself. Strings and arrays have properties and methods that allow us to easily perform some useful actions. Cool. Let's move on to 8.6.1, string modification. Use string methods to convert a word into pseudo pig Latin. Oh, I do remember this studio. It's a very interesting one. Remove the first three characters from a string and add them to the end. Example, launch code becomes nonchalau. Modify your code to accept user input. Query the user to enter the number of letters that will be relocated and then see add validation to your code to deal with user inputs that are longer than the word. Such, such in cases default to moving three characters. Oh, in such cases default to moving three characters, also the template, <clears throat> excuse me, and also the template literal should note the error. Okay, that's a lot there. But it looks like we have a code to it in Replit. So I'm gonna click on that. It's gonna open up a new tab here in my browser. So let's see what they have to play with today. In the top right here, I'm going to click fork replit. So it's going to bring it over to my own personal account. I always need to fork it. So I actually have my own stuff that I can work with. I don't actually manipulate the original file. There we go. We have opened up our index.js up here denoted in that tab. Input. Oh, look at that, guys. They already have the require in there for us. Wow. Thank you, launch code. And it also has our string, str, which denotes a string. All right. They also have one other thing here. They have A, B, and C already created for us. So a, use string methods to remove the first three characters from the string and add them to the end. Hint, define another variable to hold the new string or reassign the new string to uh, str. All right. So we're going to take a chunk of this string and move it to the back. So what it's saying is that we need to, looking at launch code, we need to take whatever they give us. We're going to say three for right now and then move it to the back. Now, that being said, can anyone tell me any of the methods they or functions they would like to use to approach this problem? Use slice. Wanna do slice for this one? We'll do slice, all right. Slice it is. 
So this is a way that we can separate our arrays or strings, which is just an array of characters. So let's go ahead and do that. First, we need to do str.slice. Slice is going to have two, uh, excuse me, two different, and we call these, by the way, since you are in studio review here, called parameters. The information you put inside the functions for them to do stuff. I'm asking for two parameters here. So it says start and end. The start is going to be zero. I want to start at the zero with index because that's where arrays start at, which is the L in this case. And then I want to end three characters in. So I'm going to do three. Right now, this is actually going to be me just testing because I always forget this, whether or not I have to do the character I want to end on and not remove or the character that it actually removes and um, takes out. So what I'm going to do here is put three in just to try it. And now I'm going to create a variable on the left hand side. Always remember, guys, if you are not talking, try to keep yourself on mute, too, just to reduce the background noise. But also, so what I'm going to do is use slice there for the string. So I'm going to say, let my first slice, oops, which one? Slice equals that. There we go. And what I'm going to do now is console log. What I'm going to do is my first my slice. And remember, slice. we can separate. We can, I'm sorry, was that a question? Did I hear a question there? No? Three, two, one, no. All right, we're gonna keep going. My first slice, which is the variable up here, and then str there. Remember, in console log, if I wanna see two things on one line of the console log, I can separate them by the comma so they print out both things. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this here. All right, awesome. It looks like my guess was right. So I see LAU. And then str here, it looks like launch code stays intact. So launch code actually stays intact when we slice it. So that might be a problem there. I don't know if we could actually use slice. Slice is gonna take out a piece and give it back to me, but it's not going to update the actual original string that was provided. So we could do slice, but we'd have to do two slices. What we could do is my first slice here, or we can rename this to my beginner, beginning slice. And then we'll have to slice off the rest of it at the very end. So we can say, let my ending slice equal str. And now I say slice again, and I would do where I want to start, which is at three, not two, three. So now I have my first or my beginning slice and my ending slice. So what I just did here on this slice is I said, hey, I want you to start at three. Why did I choose three? Well, that's because that's where we ended up here in my beginning slice. I ended at three. So for my ending slice, my ending portion, I want to start where I picked up or I start where I dropped off or yeah, I think that's the right word. I don't know. Anywho, three is where I ended. So that's where I want to start with my ending slice. So let's go ahead and run this again, see what we get. Look at that. If we look at our console log now, we're seeing that we just be, were able to split launch code into the two sections that this studio wanted us to do with LAU on the left-hand side and launch code on the right-hand side. The next step we'll have to do then is to combine this into our final string. So I'm gonna say, let my final big lat, and yeah, there we go. And what I want to do is switch my ending slice with my beginning slice. So I just switch them around. So I start with my ending slice. Say my Perfect. beginning slice, just like that. And so I'm going to take the, my final pig Latin. And I'm actually in the console log that out now. Save that. And we press run. And look at what we get. We get the ending portion first, and then the beginning portion after it. Therefore, creating, I believe, What's going on here? We go back to the studio, exactly what it wants to see. So awesome, we have completed A. It took a second, but we got A finished there. So any questions on this section? All right. I, I do have a quick question. Yeah, what's up, Blake? If we were to do re replace, and it still came out the same way. Like if you basically were saying, okay, I'm going to just replace launch code with um, inch code line. <clears throat> Could that work? 
it depends on the approach, but you could do a, rep uh, I'm trying to think of what you would want to do replace. So if you did replace, what was your first and second argument or parameter or information you put inside that replace? Like a new variable and put, uh, basically spell it differently. Like put, spell it like in C-H, C-O-D-E-L-A-U. Okay, so are you hard coding, or are you putting the direct string in there into the replace? Yes. So technically that would work, but we always want to try not to hard code our answers directly into those. Take a look at this approach that we just did. We don't hard code any portion of it. You never see a string built here. We just used all code to approach our answer. So to answer your question, yes, that will work. But the second I said, all right, let's switch it from launch code to start the dog, would your approach work? And that's a personal question you need to answer. So we need to see if we can build a solution that works for a majority of cases, not just a specific one, if that makes sense. Does that kind of help? Okay, cool. So yeah, that absolutely will work for A, but as we move forward, it might get a little tricky. Awesome question there. All right, anything else? Anything else anybody wants to talk about? All right, then let's keep going here. Oh, it says use a temperate literal. Oh, I actually missed this portion. So let's go ahead and create the temperate literal. So let's gonna say, let my final pig Latin, I'm actually going to reuse this variable name. I'm gonna comment that one out above here, just like that, because I wanna, I'm gonna take this console log and put it below this comment, just so we can keep it sectionalized. I like to know exactly what um, what portion of the studio I'm following as I move down. So my good uncle Latin, it says we need to do a temperate literal. So what kind of quote do I start with to start creating a temperate literal? Back tick. The back tick, yes. The tick, the back tick, whatever you want to call it. There was a long discussion in the first lecture about it, but we're going to go with back tick. Absolutely right. So we do that. If you are or trying to find that backtick to create your temperate literal, look above your tab key on the left-hand side. On a typical American US keyboard, that is where you should find it. It will be below the tilde, usually sometimes below the escape key as well. All right, in order to insert information to a temporal literal, what symbol do I start with? Dollar sign. The dollar sign, absolutely right. And then those curly brackets, fantastic. And now we gotta insert the variable name into this temperate literal. The first thing that we start with to build this new string is my ending slice. Then I'm gonna insert the beginning slice using that dollar sign again to insert information in there. So I say my beginning slice, there we go. Awesome, and then semicolon. There we go, we have created now our answer or our pig Latin using a temperate literal. I'm gonna go ahead and run this one more time here. Make sure that works, I'm gonna go ahead and also Push that over there so we can actually see some stuff. All right, awesome. We're getting Ansh code Lao. Fantastic. Any questions about this before we move on? All right. Then on to B, modify your code to accept user input. Query the user to enter the number of letters that will be relocated. All right. So it looks like right now we're just trying to get a number from the user. So let's go ahead and do that. So in order to do that, help me through it. What am I gonna start with? Anybody help me get the Let user, user Answer equals input dot question. Sure, absolutely, input dot question. And I'll go ahead and say, how many letters should I switch? I'll put a little space at the end there just so we can type our number in piece. All right, once the user answers this, what kind of answer are they gonna have back? What kind of data type? Number. Number, so what should we, but um, if I did the type of, of user answer, what would be the type when it get, comes back from the input.question function? String. Number. It could be a oh, string. string, string. Oh, yeah, it's gonna be a string. So what do we need to do to it so we can actually use this? Conversion, number. number. We need to convert it to a number, very good. So we say user answer equals number user answer. Just like that. So right. I got a question. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is like a replit thing or not, but I actually did the code without that and it still came out as like the, the answer I'm looking for. 
Yes, JavaScript will be nice to you about it. Okay. So it will use that string and it will say, okay, I'll pretend it's a number and try that. If it doesn't, it will break, but it was a number. And this just, that is okay because JavaScript worked, but it's not safe. So it's recommended you cast it or you convert it to a number before using it. However, JavaScript, again, it will always try to help you out. Right. But I wouldn't recommend that approach. So always just try to remember to convert to a number. But yeah, that's always JavaScript. Trying to, have, trying to be your friend. No, just trying to figure out what's more like work etiquette, I guess. Like, obviously, the end goal is to get into a job. So if the, the work professional etiquette is to do it that way, then I'll start working on doing it that way. Yeah, yeah, think of it work etiquette or just coding safety in general. It's going to save you from a bad Monday if you do that. If you try to cast it to the correct data type that you're trying to actually use, which is a number in this case. So, no, awesome question. And, and yeah, yeah, great to explore that. All right. All right, so now that we got a number in there, oh, yeah, and any other questions before we keep going? All right. In that case, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to copy what we had above here. And I'm going to take that as well to put that down here because B, we're actually going to be recycling some of the stuff from A. Remember that coders are extremely lazy, so do, uh, reusing code that you know works is always safe and also time efficient. So the user is coming in and telling us how many letters would you like to switch? The user answers it. We convert it to a number here on line 21. And now we actually got to switch it around. Now we know, or we are hoping that the user actually gives us a number here. So I want to utilize this code that we created above that we know works to be more dynamic, be more flexible to whatever the user tells us. So in that case, right now, I know that three was what the instructions on A told me. It mandated that we did three characters. Okay. But to make it more customizable, what we need to do is Use that we need to switch out that three for something that. that the user is actually giving us. So what we're going to do is going to take user answer and we're going to replace three there with it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So let's go ahead now and try this out. How many letters should, should we switch? Anybody got a number that they're feeling right now? All right. I'm seeing five. Seven. I'm going to go to put five. <laughs> seven. All right. We'll do seven next to test it. All right. We got five here. And it looks like what we did is that, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, five characters on that right-hand side. So we took five characters off and we switched it around. So it looks like that's working. Let's go ahead and run it one more time with seven here. And it looks like we got, well, ode launch C. So yes, it looks like it is working properly with that user input. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, that was B there. Any questions on that one? Get to get that user input and actually, do to whatever the user wants. So more, more uh, customizing of our application there. So that was really cool. Anything, anything at all. All right, going once, going twice, and on to C then. All right, add validation to your code to deal with user inputs that are longer than the word. In such cases, default to, or in such cases, Default to moving three characters. Also, the temperate literal should note the error. All right, let's go ahead and do that. Once again, I'm going to take what we've done up here and I'm going to duplicate it down here to part C. What I'm going to do is just comment out. I'm going to go ahead and comment out B here and move on to C. Awesome. I do I do have a quick question? So, whenever yeah. it's asking me how many letters to switch. Henry, you want to mute there. Do I press uh, seven and then just hit enter? Yeah, so when you're working with the console on the right-hand side, when it asks you that question, if you're using input.question like we are, um, go and press seven and just press the enter key, uh, enter key, yep. So whenever I do that, it says reference error zero not defined. Um, I'm going to say double check your code here. Make sure it's just okay. like this. Yep. If it's still not working at the end, we can take a one-on-one -on -one look on it. Look at it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So now we need to add validation. 
So we have our user answer coming in here and we convert it to the number now, or we convert it to the number here, but now we actually have to check to see if the number that they're entering is actually correct. If they put 100 here, that is not okay because we are gonna be looking for 100 with zero to 100 and trying to add that to a string. Well, launch code is not 100 characters long, so that is not a correct way we should be doing that. So let's go ahead and add validation. Can anyone tell me the tool we're gonna be using here to add that validation? If user answer is greater than nine. Absolutely right. Yeah, when we add validation or when they say validation, that is an extremely clear indication that you are most likely gonna be using an if statement or at least a conditional. So yeah, you're absolutely right. We're gonna be doing an if statement here. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna say if. Now, can anyone tell me what do they would, how they would wanna write this conditional? Length. User greater than nine. User answer greater than string dot length. Length. String dot length. Um, str dot, dot length. But do you wanna do greater than or equal to? Yeah. Um, Very good. Yes, Absolutely yes. right. That is an awesome interjection. Yes. I was going to let this ride and like, we're going to have some fun with this one. But you are absolutely right. We're going to be doing greater than or equal to. And let me explain why. String dot length. If we ask this question right now, and I'm going to go grab string so we actually can see it in this presentation here. Let me bring it down here. String right here. I'm going to comment. Sorry. Comment that out. There we go. All right. STR is down here on line 30. Launch code is one, two, three, four. Oh, wow. Four. And then what is that? Four plus six, 10. Okay. <laughs> Math is hard. It is 10 characters long launch code. Now, when you ask for the length of it, it's going to say 10. You ask for the length of launch code. Launch code is 10 characters long. But here's the question What is the greatest index? of the launch code string array. Nine. Nine. Very good, nine, absolutely right. So if user answer, or sorry, if user answer says, I want you to do, um, oh. 10. Yeah, if I wanna do 10, let me actually think this through. Oh, I should've gotten that coffee, guys, I really should. have. <laughs> All right, user answer is 10, we're gonna do 10 characters, so we're gonna so technically, actually, it depends on how we want to approach this. So yeah, greater than or equal to length, that is fine. Because if the user says, I want you to want to do one character, I want you to do, um, if, I say, if it says, I only want you to do 10 characters, that's technically appropriate too. But we're going to have to do something to that answer now that I think about it. So let's go ahead and continue here. So yeah, we want to do greater than or equal to, we're going to ride with that just for a moment. I'm going to try this out. So if the user answer is greater than or equal to the string dot length, meaning if they say 10 or something more, we need to give them an error. But before we even give them an error, what do we need to do? What does it say that our default needs to be? Three. Three. So when it says our default needs to be three, it means that we need to reassign our variable to the safe amount of three. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to say user answer is going to be reassigned to three there. After that, we need to actually display an error. So it says that the temporal literal, it said it should actually display an error, which I'm trying to think exactly how they would want us to do that in a nice way. Let's see. Also, the temporal literal should note the error. Okay. Well, we know what we can do that. What we're going to do is that we're going to say, I'll put the message up here. So we're gonna say my final pig Latin message is empty quotes for right now. So in this if statement, what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna include the error now in the my final pig Latin, because that's what we're gonna be showing the user. So my final pig Latin, I'm gonna say equals the string is only the r dot length. What are you doing? <laughs> So there we go. Now we're actually displaying an error there. So we have an error stored somewhere that we can actually display to the user, but let's keep working through a problem to see exactly where we could maybe use that puzzle piece here as we move forward. So if the answer, user's answer is greater than or equal to the string.length, we update it to the default, which is three, and then we store an error inside of the my final pig Latin variable. 
So once that's done, we can actually come down here and do our work. We can actually go ahead and do the beginning slice and ending slice. And now we can actually do the My Final Pig Latin creation. What I'm going to do is take out let there. Why I took let, let out there is because I actually put it up here on line 35 now. I put it on line 35 again so I can store an error in case this conditional is true. OK, we have an error. Here is what I want to put my error. So what I'm going to do is that if there is an error here, I want it to actually display on my string. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say over here, my final pig Latin, just like that. What this is going to do is that this is going to display the error in our string if it's there, or if there's no error, what was it assigned to originally? Nothing, empty quotes. So essentially, this is either going to be empty quotes or the error that we're showing inside of our temperate literal. That temperate literal then is reassigned to this one. So we're basically just building upon itself, including my ending slice and my beginning slice. This is a tricky little way you could do it. And you can do this in multiple different approaches. This is just me attacking this and trying to, trying to find a way to minimize the amount of code that I write. So let's go ahead and run this before I ask if there's any questions and see what happens. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run. I'm going to say, I want to switch only five letters. I see I still get back haunch code. Awesome. See if what happens if I say 100. I still get back haunch code because it's three. Or sorry, I get nonch code in this one. But then I get my error. The string is only 10 long. What are you doing? Awesome. We're actually getting back our error now. Now let's go through that really, really quickly and see exactly what happened. When I typed in five, what happened was is that it got translated over here, casted or converted to the number five. My final pick Latin was empty quotes. It came in here, is five greater than or equal to 10? It is not. So this if statement does not get triggered. Therefore, we come down here. We prepare our beginning and ending slice that we saw in part A and part B, nothing new there. But this is where our string gets built. We add our ending slice and our beginning slice here, and then we include empty quotes. We don't include anything, so it's just blank. So it looks like the proper answer. And then, of course, we console log it so we can see it on the console. If I enter in 100, we come through here, and we have a couple different circumstances. Of course, our 100 gets transferred or gets converted over there to a number, so the number 100. Our final pig Latin is empty quotes. 100 is greater than or equal to 10. Therefore, our user answer gets updated to three. So user answer is now three. My final pig Latin is now given this error to hold on to. We come down here, oops. We come down here, we do our beginning and ending slicing. And then now we put our ending slice in first, then our beginning slice, and then my pig Latin, like I said, was assigned that error up there. So now we include that error to show in our console. And then finally we console log it so we can actually see it. Any questions about that? Anyone angry that I did it that way? No, that was really neat. Yeah. Micah, what's going on? <laughs> um, so can you run it without, like, with it being in the, um, like, three, put three in there or something? I want to see what's. Do so you want three here? Wow, yeah, I don't, I'm going to need to take a picture of this and <laughs> rewatch that. Because I do not understand why on line 44, you are assigning the variable my pig, my final pig Latin to mm -hmm. the variable my final pig Latin. So Explain tell me, me how that works. On three, if I type in three here on line 44, what is the value of my final pig Latin at this case? Remember, the program is going to look at the right hand side of the equal sign before it does the left hand side. So on the right-hand side of the equal sign, what is the value of my final pig Latin at this moment? Would you say three? Blank. Remember, three is actually Blank. being stored in user answer. Remember, three is being stored in user answer. That's mm -hmm. where our three is. So user answer will actually be three. What happens on line 35? Uh, it's just a blank string. What is a blank string? My, my final pig Latin. My final pig Latin is a blank string. Does this if statement return true or false? Um, true, because. 
Take a look what at it. what is user three? answer. What is the value of a user answer? Three. What is string dot length? Uh, more than three. Exactly. Is be three? False. False, so bad. it's going to be false. So does this if statement trigger? Uh, no. No. So at this moment now, at line forty-one, what is the value of my final pig Latin? Um, it's just a blank string. So. Very good. Okay. So we do our fancy stuff right here, and we come down to line 44. At line 44, what is the value of my final pig Latin on the right-hand side string. of the equals? Okay, I see, I see, I see. Thanks, Rick. Always sequentially. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely right. Oh, so Kyle, so we, yeah. I got the same answer as you did, but I used an else. Now, is there like a right or wrong answer as far as like whether else is correct or if your method is correct? So if you put an else here, what did you put inside the else statement? Um, so... I, I mean, obviously, I did it a little bit different, um, but I continued to keep the string that slice three plus string that slice zero, comma three, and then console dot log. You have entered the invalid number, dollar sign, user answer, and then the default answer is three. Your new word is dollar sign string that slice three plus string that slice. Yeah, I mean, if you use an else statement and it technically works, we can take a closer look at it to make sure everything's fine. But there's a million. I mean, ways yeah, I got the same it. answer. I just want to okay. go. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I it's the same answer. You can use it. You can use an else. Um, right here, I was trying to reduce, so I didn't want to copy and paste these two things twice in the if statements. So I tried to figure out a way. All right, how can I just write one if statement and not have to copy and paste the same line of code? So I don't have to do repetitive code. That's my OC, coder OCD inside of me. He's like, I don't want to do repetitive code. I don't want to have two lines that do the exact same thing if I can just have one. But right. if you find that with the if and else statement, that's okay too. Well, you can definitely keep moving forward, doubling that code up. That's completely fine. As we move forward, that's when we'll learn what, what code is necessary and which ones, what is not. Gotcha. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. And if you want to look at that also at the end of this, just let me know. Just tell me to stay on and I can take a look. No, I think I'm good. I just wanted I just wanted to see if you had any input as far as like what was more again, going back to like etiquette or preferable like for the class and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, any other a, questions? Yeah. Yeah, I do have a quick question. Um, so um I guess line thirty eight, what is the point of the user answer being set equal to three? I just wanna feel yeah. a little confused by that. So in our instructions it says that if the user enters an input longer than the word, meaning in this case, longer than 10, mm -hmm. we should default it to three characters. Okay. When you see this, it says that basically setting default, meaning reassign it to three if they made a mistake. Oh. So that's what we're doing here. We're reassigned it to three when they made that mistake. Okay, so it'll always say onch code lol. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, okay. If they enter something greater than 10. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Absolutely. Kyle, Kyle yeah. in, in line 28 that we just read, it said the user only if the user un inputs that are longer than the word, right? So it should be line 37 should be just greater than. I just realized it. Let's take a close look. Um, let's go ahead and run this real quick. So let's go ahead and enter in 10 here. So in that case, technically, yes. Um, I think if they were entering, technically if they want to do, okay, let's run this one more time. Let's see, because that's what but it could be zero, right? Yeah, believe so. Yeah, zero changes nothing. One, um, let's see what nine does. Yeah, technically they cannot do 10, because if we did 10, it would just flip it back over to launch code. So we actually should be greater than or equal to the string dot length. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if we did 10, that would basically just say, let's do a full cycle. Let's switch launch code to launch code. In that mm -hmm. case, we've defeated the purpose of the program. Yes, yes. Absolutely. No, no, great question too. I needed to make sure too in my head. So awesome. All right, any final questions before we move on, everyone? All so, right. I gotta go yep. to work. I'll see you guys later. Thanks so much. Absolutely, thanks Bye. for stopping by. I have one question. So. I have like this, I, it looks like I have the same exact thing as you do, but for some reason, if I were to type 10, I can't get it to print the string is only uh, three long or whatever. 
like the okay. what are you doing I, yeah so take a very close look at my code if you can't figure it out no worries just hop on or stay on after class or stay on after this and we'll we'll go through it uh one-on-one -on -one. all right all right let's keep diving into this on to 8.6.2 array and string conversion. The split and join methods convert back and forth between strings and arrays. Use delimiters as reference points to split a string into an array and modify the array and convert it back into a printable string. Okay, wow. And we have an A through E here. What I'm gonna do is open up the replet here and we're gonna go through those A through E's. All right, as always in the top right, I can click for the replet. Perfect. All right, I'm seeing proto array one, two, three, and four. Okay, and we got in, uh, strings. All right, we got a bunch of stuff we got to do here. Let's go to A first. Use includes method to check to see if the words in each string are separated by commas, semicolons, or just spaces. Okay, <laughs> we can do this. Let's do this. Use includes to method to check to see if the words in each string are separated. Let's keep reading down just to make, because I'm like, all right. If the strings use commas, separate the words, split them in arrays. If the, if the strings use commas to separate the words, split them into an array, reverse the entries, then join the array into the new comma separate strings. Oh, all right. Why do they make us do so much stuff? Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and start with part A. What are we going to use? What tool? What checks things? If. If. That's what we're going to do here. So if. Do we have to do each, every one of them? That's exactly what I was asking myself. Jeez. <laughs> so much work. All right. It gets easier. It does. Oh my, our team, we had to like write four sets, checking everything for includes. <laughs> Is that bad when the like instructor's like, do we really have to do this? All right. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> let's go ahead and do it because let's learn. Well, question though, like did no, it no. the strings in line six? I'm sorry. Like if you look at line six, would that cover all of the one through four? If Technically, you did yes. Uh, I don't know what they exactly want us to do with the strings array. Right now, what I'm going to do is just pretend they didn't tell me to use the strings array. So I'm gonna go ahead and use them individually, but we can okay. do that. Um, I mean, we can all, we'll, we'll go through this example, then I'll, I'll show kind of a faster way we could have done it. But for this one, we're gonna go ahead and just do them separately. So prototype.array, it says we need to check to see if it uses commas, semicolons, or just spaces. So what I'm gonna do is use the includes method as it tells me to do. If it includes, I'm gonna do it in double quotes just so we don't have any uh, fusion, we have do that. So if it is, if it includes commas, I'm going to assume it's commas. What I'm going to do here, say else, then that if statement again, I did an else if here, if it does the semicolon, I can chain these because this is all in one situation here. If it doesn't include commas, or if it includes commas, then we do that. If it doesn't, it must probably do semicolons. If it doesn't, it must probably hopefully do spaces then. We'll figure it out. Um, just or just spaces. Okay, so what if okay, because I would yeah, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. All right. So we have done this now for prototype array one. Awesome. If the string uses commas to separate the oh gosh, to separate the words, split it into an array, reverse the entries, and then join the array into the new com comma separated string. Okay, let's learn some magic. We're gonna start with prototype array one because that's who we're working with up in this if statement. Prototype array one. If first says to split it into an array, how we take a string and split it into an array is using one of those magic functions that we learned about in class. We didn't learn about it, but it, they, you learned that they exist. And that one that we need to know that exists is called split. Here, we're going to be splitting on a comma. What that does is it goes and looks at, okay, where's the commas at? All right, if I see a comma, I'm gonna make it into its own container. So once I split it into that, it's going to become an array of three, six, nine, and 12. We're going to take a look at that real quick here in a moment. What I'm going to do and 
I'm going to put what gets split into over there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to console log this so we can see exactly what happened here. Prototype array one. Awesome. Let me go and run that. And look at what it does. It takes all the commas, removes the commas, and instead turns it into this array here. So that's what the dot split method does. So cool. We separated by the comma. Oh, sorry. We split it into an array. Now we need to reverse the entries. I don't know. How could we reverse the entries of an array? Maybe dot reverse. Mm. Ta da! Right? Craziness. Oh, you just do the dot reverse there. We run this and let's see what happens now. Look at that. All of our entries just reverse. So 12 is now first, three is now last. Everything has been swapped. Awesome. All right. We reverse the entries, then join the array into a new comma separated string. How can we join something? Can anyone have a possible guess of how we could join an array together? How can we join? Join. Proto oh, awesome. Join. <laughs> Absolutely right. Dot join. Very good. And it says we need to join with commas. Let me, let me, oh, I cannot pronounce words today. To separate them. How we do that is we include a character inside of the join function. In that case, I'm going to just put a comma there to join it. And look at what we just did. We joined it back together into a string. Dot join takes an array splits it into some way, forms back into a string, and shoves it back into that whatever variable, excuse me, is there waiting for it. So awesome. We are now able to reverse the array and join it back into a string, and now we're able to see it. Any questions on what we just did there? We just completed B there for the comma. Uh, we did not store the original uh, proto array one in any other variable that's fine right because into a new variable we actually um oh, is that what you're asking i'm sorry yes yes okay yeah uh, in this case, it. Oh. say that one more time um we did not save the original uh proto error one in any other variable before we changed it and that's fine right um yeah, uh, as, as of right now, I think that's fine until we see somewhere in the instructions that tells us that we're going to need that information again. That's when it's an indicator saying, oh, I shouldn't have changed that variable. I need to create a new one. Oh. So as of right now, I think it's fine. But okay. if we don't want to, we can also, we can also, um, yeah, we can create another variable. But we'll see what we come to that. But does that help out, Hannah? Yes, thank you. Absolutely. All right. So B is done. I put that into there. C, if the string uses semicolons, so I'm going to go ahead and put this into the semicolon thing. Bear with me here. I know that prototype array one does not use semicolons, but we're going to switch some things up. If the string uses semicolons to separate the words, split it into a new comma separated string. All right. So what I'm going to do now is take prototype to array here, and I'm going to switch everything out. I'm going to just keep building upon this. There we go. Proto array two uses semicolon. So what do we have to do again? All right, we got to split it. So what we're going to do is say proto type array two oops, equals proto type array two and split it. How do we split it again? What do we use? Split. No, we're going to use split. But what are we going to put inside the parentheses here? Semicolon. Very good. The semicolon, what we actually need to split it on. Awesome, awesome. All right, we split into the array. Then we need to alphabetize the entries. They are just not being nice at all. How are we going to alphabetize the, uh, the entries? Sort. Very good. We're going to sort it. Awesome job. So we can say sort here. Very good. Then join the array into a new comma separate string. Well, before we even do that, I want we haven't used this. I've used split before, but we have not used sort so let's see what it does we're gonna go and run this well it mm -hmm. looks like it's it was a c m and e but now it's a c e and m and last time i checked my alphabet that is correct e comes before m so it, it is sorting properly awesome and the final thing we need to do is join it together using a comma so someone talk uh, talk me through that how do i join something with a comma dot join very good dot Parenth join parenthesis 
both. There we go. All um, right, we got parentheses. What are we need to include in here? And uh, uh, quotes and a comma. Good, quotes and a comma. What we actually want to separate it by. Awesome. Let's go and run this and see what we get now. Awesome. We get A, C, E, and M. Cool. All right, we're on a roll. Let's take D here. D, if the string uses spaces to separate the words split into an array, reverse alphabetize the entries, and then join the array into a new space separated string. All right, looks like prototype three, it's your turn because you have spaces. Switch that all over here. There we go. All right, let's do this one. So we need to split it. I'll help us out with that. So we're gonna say prototype because we're gonna reassign prototype three array here. Prototype three, there we go. We're gonna split it and we're gonna split it on spaces. We'll just put a little space in there. And then we need to reverse alphabetize the entries. Who can tell me how they wanna reverse alphabetize the entries? Anybody have any ideas? Would you dot sort it first and then dot reverse? John, a whole pan of brownie points. Absolutely Ooh. right. Very good. Yes, we are going to sort first, and then we are going to reverse that array. So we are going to sort it from A to Z, and then we reverse it. So it's now Z to A. So absolutely right. That is how we're going to do that. So let's go and see if that works. Before we celebrate, we've got to check. Awesome. And run this. So now we see string space and del deline uh, delineated, uh, delimited, delimited. All the brain cells are gone. All right, <laughs> delimited. So uh, space, delimited string. That was what our original string was. We are now truly reverse alphabetizing that array. And it's also in an array now too. So there we go. Last thing we need to do is make it back into a string. So we say dot join. And it says we need to make it into a new space separated string. So we say dot join here, we put it back for spaces. Awesome, let's run that again, see what happens. Sweet, there we go. We have C string, space, and delimited. Awesome. All right, that, are, that is our if statements for that. So once we have that done, the thing says we need to do this for all of them. So what do we do? We copy our entire solution there. We paste it three times. So now we have four if statements. I'm showing you all the laziest way possible. Awesome. And now we go through it with fun and we paste it in there. Just like that. I feel like a Bob Ross of laziness. Yes, there we go. Just a little bit of laziness. All right. Almost done. And then we're gonna take a quick look. Oh, actually, no, I gotta see. We're just getting late too. Maybe if we have time, we'll come back. You guys wanna see the simple solution to this? Yes. <laughs> Please. Anybody else? Anybody? Please. I mean, I will, and I will show it to you. I just wanna make sure I get one more yes. Anybody else wanna see yes. the simple solution? Yes, yes. for sure. Yes. Yeah. All right, yes. Yes. all right, all right. Let's go ahead and see the simple solution. All right, so up here, what it did was it created this, and also they didn't create it correctly. Don't tell launch code. We'll mm -hmm. put a let there. We also put a come out now. Let's put let. They created an array up here for us. That's nice of them. And what arrays are nice for is that it's, again, that shipping container full of information instead of all these separate things. That's what the problem was in this whole problem is that we have four separate values here, four separate containers, four separate things. Down here, we have one container, one thing that we can just work with and deal with. That's it. Who wants all the is, these if statements? I sure don't. So let's go and see how we can get rid of them. What we can do with arrays is that we know there's a set of stuff in this container. And as me, as a person who was working at Amazon, going through this container, I want to go box by box and see what's in every single thing. When I say I'm going to go box by box, I'm going to loop through my boxes. I am going to loop through this container. So today, to get this more simplified, we need to loop through our array. The loop I'm going to introduce to you tonight is called a for loop. 
We have not been introduced to these yet in lecture. So if you feel like you don't want to listen to this, close your ears, turn on music. It's fine. We haven't got into this stuff, so don't worry about it. But I will quickly show you the better solution here. The looper, again, we're going to be using is called a for loop. What this does is that it is basically something that counts. It counts from a starting number to an ending number. That's it. It's nothing else fancier. It literally just counts. So you need to tell it where to start. In this case, we say let i, which i stands for index. It's saying, okay, I want you to create this little variable so you can just count for me. And I say, I want you to start at zero. Because remember, programmers start counting at zero because we're weird. <laughs> Once we do that, we separate our for loop with this thing, the semicolon thing that you've seen quite often. For loops need three different things in it. Where, where to start, where to end, and what to do in between. We just told it where to start. We're going to tell it where to end. When I, or well, or sorry, we're going to say keep looping while I, the index we just did, declared right there, is less than strings, the array up there, dot length. So I want you to keep looping through this for loop as I is less than strings dot length. I'm going to say I plus plus. Again, this is what we do every single time it iterates. What I plus plus means is just increment, increment by one. I plus plus is synonymous for I plus, I equals I plus one. It's the same thing. It's how you shorthand it. Remember, programmers are lazy. We have a lot of shorthands. I plus plus is how we do that. It just says increment by one. So let's see this thing in action. We're gonna console log I. Can anyone tell me what they think they're gonna see here? Zero, one, two, three. Absolutely right. We're going to see 0, 1, 2, 3. Don't worry about the other stuff from the actual exercise. We're going to look at these numbers. 0, 1, 2, and 3. Awesome job. Yes, it just counts. That's all it does. But tell me this, 0, 1, 2, 3. Doesn't that sound fairly familiar? Look at where prototype array 1, 2, 3 are in 4. That's at the 0th index, the 1st index, the 2nd index, 3rd index. Though for loops are very simplistic and they just count, makes them extremely powerful when it comes to arrays. How they just counted lines up with how our indexes are in our arrays. So now we can use this to actually loop through our array a little bit easier. So how can we actually do this? Well, let's go ahead and tell it to say, hey, let my roto array equal strings of zero, or sorry, of the i index. i, again, is the thing that's being counted, is, that is counting up. Let's go ahead and console log and see what this does. I'm going to go ahead and run this. Take a look at what happens here. It just printed out every string for you. Printed out 3, 6, 9, 12, Acme, the space delimited string. This one down here with a bunch of other words. It printed out everything in that strings array up here because we are looping through it. How we loop through it was bracket notation using our variable i. Remember that this variable i was declared up here. And as you just saw in that example previously, it counts. So i at one instance is zero. It loops through again, it's, uh, yeah, then it's one. It loops through again, it's two. It loops through again, and then it's three. Remember, though this is loop and it's going back and forth, things are still going sequentially. Things don't just happen magically. Sequentially, sequentially, sequentially. It starts at line eight, loops through here, goes to line 12, comes back up to line eight, says, do I loop again? It says, yes, you're only at zero. You have three more times. It goes through again, nine, 10, 11, comes back up to eight. Should I loop again? Yes. And it keeps going through there. Every time it loops, I is incremented by one. That right there is a for loop and how it works with an array. Now, to continue on, how do we take this if statement and utilize it? Well, now we can put this if statement in here. Instead of just saying prototype array one, what we can do is actually use my proto array, which is being changed every time the loop iterates. So we take my proto array and we replace it. We replace my proto or proto array one with it. Just like that. In that case, once we do that. Let's see if it'll actually run for me. It's just mad because I don't have a closing one. There, no stop. Oh, 
Oh, because I don't make console log. There it is. I need that. I haven't console log anything. My proto array. There it is. Now we can actually see something. I was like, what's not going there? Awesome. Now we're actually console logging the true answer. So now we see that in, in a fourth of the code, just using one loop, we're actually able to see all of the answers done for us automatically. So who regrets asking me to see the simplified solution? Nobody. No? Good. That was Good. Only a few people logged off. What was that? That was amazing. <laughs> awesome. So Good I actually hear. have a little bit of a question kind of going off of this solution. So I, the minute I saw all of the if statements and the tests, I like my mind jumped to a for loop. Um, Good. I was wondering, is there, could you take it one step further and include testing each array within that for loop? And what would that look like? And like, is that what they wanted us to do in this exercise? So what do you mean by test each array in, in the, in the, I'm sorry, test each thing in the array? Yeah. So like in part A, we tested to see if there was a comma, if there was a semicolon, if it was space delimited. You could, you like, how would you do that within the for loop? So for example, if you wanted to write a for loop that encompass like parts A through E. So that's exactly what we just did. That it, this is the solution to that exact question. So okay. our for loop contains that if statement that checks every single case for each of those arrays. Remember, my proto array changes to prototype one, two, three, and four every time the loop iterates. So oh, we are actually okay. checking all of those cases. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. So it doesn't matter which one, even if we added a proto array five or 100 in here. As long as we add it into that array, we're checking all of those cases, the comma, semicolon, and space. Uh, okay, situation. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I see, yeah, okay. Cool, no, 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 all good, all good, awesome. Awesome, awesome. And great that your mind jumped right to a for loop. Awesome there too. Any other questions about this? All right, let's keep moving. Oh, well, I'm actually happy we did that because now we're on to, okay, so that was 8.6.2. Whew, that was a big one too. So yeah. that is technically the end of the studio. So we are on to 8.6.3. It is 9.23. So if you have to hop off, I completely understand. If you want to just stick in there, feel free to keep on going with me here. I'm going to do the bonus mission, but I just want to let you all know what time it is and where we're at. But any final questions before we move in to this bonus mission? Is there a way I can see the code one more time, which you get on yours before you, you erase that? <laughs> Is there a way I can actually look at this outside of this uh, screen of yours? So it's going to be in the in the studio section of the YouTube video. So you're basically see this screen, just feel free oh. to pause it. Okay. Yeah, I see yeah. that. All right. Cool. If, that's a, if that causes an issue, just let me know. We can take a look at other solutions. Blake, was, was that you? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. When do those get uploaded? Those will always be uploaded in the mornings, hopefully uh, the day after. So you should see this. They've been being uploaded about 10 and 11 a.m. Usually I'm a little bit faster at the 6 a.m., but um, yeah, usually in the mornings the next day. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Any other questions here? Oakley doakley. Let's keep going. Excuse me. All right. Deep breaths, everyone. Deep breaths. 8.6.3 bonus mission, multi-dimensional arrays. Hoo-hoo. Multi-dimensional. We're going to the multiverse. I was just watching Rick and Morty the other day. I've never watched that show ever. Hilarious. Rick Anywho. Rick and Morty. <laughs> it's so funny. Honestly, I was like, I'm not a big cartoon person, but I started watching like, you know what? This is kind of funny. It's like, it is kind of nerdy too. It's just so Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> bonus mission, multi-dimensional arrays. Arrays can be stored in other arrays. What? Yes, they can. Up to three dimensions, too. Well, technically. Anyway, uh, the cargo hold. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Part A, the cargo hold in our shuttles contains several smaller storage spaces. Useful to convert the strings in this stuff. Okay, I have a feeling, just like the other ones. Yep, there it is. Code wrap. I'm going to open this up first. I'm going to read these A through E sections inside of here. So I open up that link there, top right, click for replit. It's 
gonna load it to the speed of my internet. It is all right. right. Move that over just a little bit so we can see this. All right. Here we go, we have all of that neat stuff there. Use the split to convert the strings into four cabinet arrays. Alphabetize the contents of each cabinet. All right, well, that one we know, so I'm not gonna take too much time with that. We're gonna say food equals food. Dot, you know what, let's just make them in a different variables just in case, I have a feeling. Let cab, oh gosh, how do you spell cabinet? Yeah, oh, thank you, gosh. All right, <laughs> let cabinet, let's say, we're gonna say food cabinet. Food cabinet equals food dot split. So it says to split it. It is uh, split with a comma. 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 Yes, it is. Absolutely. Um, and then alphabetize. So we need to sort it. So we alphabetize. There we go. All right. Sounds good to me. What I'm going to do is I got three more I got to do. So we have equipment. We got pets. I think I can actually do this too. See, copy and pasting is no joke. <laughs> All right, there we go. So we just created those four variables. This I call the food cabinet. Was that? This, this one more on, on the line 11. Line 11. Oh, I, you are absolutely correct. Thank you, thank you. There we go. You're welcome. Awesome. All right, so now we have our four cabinets in there and they are all being alphabetized. Any questions about that? All right, let's move on to B here. Initialize a cargo hold array and add the cabinet arrays to it. Print cargo hold to verify its structure. Ooh, okay. I'm gonna call it let cargo hold. How do I start creating an array again? Oh. Notation. Empty uh, bracket, empty, empty. Bracket. And a square bracket. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to use utilize bracket notation too to contain all the information. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Square brackets. All right. I'm going to say food cabinet, equipment cabinet, pets cabinet. I always have your pets with you. Sleep aids. Oh, all right. We have our cargo hold array created. All I did was I took these, which are going to be arrays now because we do a dot uh, split on it. Once you see a dot split, that means, okay, the string's turning into an array for sure. And then we sort it. So it's gonna be an alphabetized array, but array nonetheless, and we place it into another array. So we just made our first two dimensional array, an array with an array, arrayception. What we're gonna do now is console log cargo hold to see what this thing looks like. All right, everyone hold the breath. What's this thing gonna even look like? Wow, that is a lot of square brackets there. Let's go and take a look at it. So we have our first opening and closing bracket. This is the first array. Inside of this array, we have other arrays. The second you hear that sentence, you are dealing with a two-dimensional array at least. Inside, or the inner or first inner array, is that foo? And then we have some equipment, and then for some reason, alien eggs is a pet, but we have our pets and then we have our sleeping aids. So it looks like our arrays within this array is being um, created properly. So any questions on this two-dimensional array we just saw? That was awesome. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> All right, any, any, other, any questions, any questions at all? But I'm happy you guys are all seeing that two-dimensional array for the first time. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep moving then. This is query the user to select a cabinet zero to three in the cargo hold. All right, well, oh, who can help me out with this one? What do we need to do first to start querying the user? Yes, I know it's 9.30. Yes, I'm still asking questions. Help me out here. What are we gonna do? Uh, read lines. The input. Very good, yes, const input. Again, you can call it whatever you want. We usually just call it input for most examples, but remember, you, the creativity is still yours. If you wanna call it Cheerios, you can call it Cheerios. <laughs> read line sync though, must stay read line sync. So we actually need to ask for that package. So yes, absolutely right. So we have input there. Now we need to ask the user to select a cargo hold. So we're gonna say, let's, we're well, actually gonna say const because we don't want it to change. Once the user selects something, I don't want anyone to have to update it. So const user, 
cargo oh, cabinet cabinet selection equals input dot question which cabinets would you like let's say zero through three just so the user knows there we go awesome and i'm going to go and console log it to make sure my user is doing that oh kyle what are you forgetting kyle i'm sorry yes i need to take that user's input which is a string and what do i need to do with it make it a number oh I make it a number. number i almost went against my own rules there we go Awesome, now I'm gonna console log it. So what I did too is I changed that to a let because I reassigned it from a string when I changed it to a number. So I needed to make it a let. There we go. So I'm gonna take out this console log here and then run this. I'm gonna say zero and I get printed back zero. Baby steps, we're working. No trip ups just yet. Let's keep on going. Use bracket notation. And, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Any questions? about what we just did there for input. All right. Part D, use bracket notation and a template, template literal to display the contents of the selected cabinet. If the user entered an invalid number, print an error message. All right, mm -hmm. so use bracket notation. Okay, hokey dokey. So if, so first I need to check to make sure this number is even correct. So I need to make sure that the user cabinet selection is less than the cargo hold dot length. That is a big thing right there. I need to make sure that whatever they selected is less than the length of the cargo hold. If they selected four, we don't have a fourth index of this cargo hold. Therefore, that's gonna be an error. Remember, we started zero, one, two, and three. We don't have four. It needs to be zero through three. Cargo hold is a length of four. Yeah. Three is less than four. Four is not less than four. Therefore, that's how our conditional is going to work. So here, everything is okay. Down here is where we need to display an error. So it says we need to print out an error message. So I'm gonna say console. Oh, I wonder if I can do this. Console error, this will be fun. It makes it red. That's all it does. Literally, that's all it does is that it says, it just makes it a red text. Instead of console.log, it's console.error. Let's see if I can do this. What are you doing? There we go, that's my error. All right, let's go do this baby steps. I wanna see if this actually works. All right, 100. Oh, it doesn't make it red. That's not even fun. All right, we'll just switch it over to log then. And the other ones, it typically makes it red. And red text just scares the, the jeebus out of people. All right. We say 100, which is out of the range of zero and three. Therefore, we get the, what are you doing? Because it's an error. Just to give it a little bit more context there, I'm gonna say the word error there, colon, and then what are you doing? All right, so we're displaying that error. We did that low-hanging fruit. Let's go and see what we have to do if everything is okay. It says we need to display the contents of the selected cabinet. So we can display that content. So what we do is we do a console log because it said display. So it means it needs to be, um, so it needs to be human readable. So we say console.log, and then we say the cargo hold, and we say at what index. Now remember, we don't always have to hard code a number in here. We can use a variable that has a number locked inside of it. Ask yourself, what variable are we working with here that has a number locked inside of it? Your answer was that user input that we converted up here on line 24. You're absolutely correct. So what I'm gonna do is that inside of this bracket notation, I'm gonna include that variable that is a number. I'm gonna say, hey, whatever this user said they wanted, go ahead and use that as my number in that bracket notation and print out the contents of the cargo hold. And my con or hopefully JavaScript will be like, cool, Kyle, I'll do what you asked today. All right, I'm gonna say two. Two is going to be the very weird pets cabinet. Press enter, and I get back alien eggs, cats, moose, and parrots. Whoever's bringing moose to space, very interesting, but it's okay. So yes, what looks like when we type that in, it is actually showing us the contents of the correct cargo hold. So any questions on what we just did there? Um, I have a question because I'm following along and, and running mine. And when I put in 100, it tells me that there's a type error assignment to a constant variable. 
is your user cabinet selection constant? Uh, oh yeah, I guess I assigned the wrong one. Sorry, that was stupid. No worries. No, no, completely fine. Remember when it says that, it means we're reassigning to a variable that is constant. So when we see that, check out what line that the error is telling us on. Check out that so, line number and that should tell us where the constant is. And which variable did you make constant again? The user, because I thought you made the user input constant so that they couldn't change. I did until I remembered that I had to change it over to a number. So that was my own slight stupidity there that I had to like, okay, it can't be constant. I have to change it to a number. So I changed it to let after that. I gotcha. I got two in the zone and missed that. So no worries, no worries. Of course, it's a split second whenever I do it. So all good. All good. Awesome. Any other questions? All right. Let's keep going then. Final one to 28 friends out there. Good for you all sticking through this. Part E, modify the code to query the user for both a cabinet in cargo hold and a particular item. Use the includes method to check if the cabinet contains the selected item, then print cabinet blank does slash does not contain blank. All right, launch code. Of course, the last one is always the trickiest. All right. Let's go ahead and do this. What I'm going to do is copy the code that I did for the user cabinet selection. And now I'm going to come down here. I'm going to say user item selection. Because when we're in a cabinet, we need to get an item. So which item index would you like? And I don't actually know what numbers, because they can be different. They can be only two items in there or one item in there. there we go. So modify the code to query the user for both a cabinet in the cargo hold and a particular item. Oh, to see if it contains a selected item. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So which item? So it's actually going to give it an item name. I'm sorry about that. All right. So which item name do you want? So which item would you like? So if I'm asking for parrots up here in my pets area, it should be able to find it. Do we need so to delete say, library six? I do, I do. And you know what we can do now? course is going to make everything confusing for everyone but now that we don't have to reassign it we can actually change let back to const for this one you don't have to but if you just want to do some good housekeeping keeping everything tidy that is a okay to do that all right so now we need to see if the items actually inside of the cargo hold cabinet that they chose so that's what we're going to do here i need to check something therefore i'm going to use an if statement if my cargo hold of the user cabinet selection, which they chose up here first, it says to use the dot includes. So I say includes includes the user item selection there. Then we are able to do a good console log. So we're going to do a tempered literal. So I start with a back tick there. And it says I need to print out this big old thing. And so I'm going to copy and paste that in there. The blanks, luckily, are exactly where I need to include my information in my tempered literal. To do that, I do dollar sign to say I want to start putting information in there. And in this case, I'm going to say in cabinet, user cabinet choice, using cabinet selection. It's going to say does contain, because this includes would be true, so it does include it dollar sign, and then our user item selection. There we go. Let's go ahead and see if this works. Which cabinet would I like? The pets one, please, with two. Those are all my choices there. Which one would I like? I would like the moose, please. Cabinet two does contain moose. Look at that. We are now able to check to see if our moose is properly stored in our pets container. Isn't that great? What happens though, if we run this again and we say two, and I want to get a dog out, we don't get anything back, but we are supposed to be returning that console log. So now I'm going to go ahead and if it doesn't include it, or if it does include it, then we do the top if statement. Otherwise, aka the only other situation it could be is it doesn't have it, because we're at a true and false situation here. So what I'm going to do is say grab this console log here and say it does not contain it. 
run that. Save two. I would like the dog, please. Cabinet two does not contain a dog. So there we go. We were able to do this if statement to properly display a temperate literal depending or if or if not, that dog or moose is in that pet cargo hold. So there we go. And of course, yeah, we use that temperate literal. So any questions on any of that? I was just curious if there was ever a scenario where you would need to, like we converted cabinet selection to be a number, if there's any scenario where you think that we would need to convert um, the item selection to a string. No, in this case, because question or the input dot question will always, 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 always return you a string that can be counted on. So in that case, we don't have to convert it to a string because we know for a fact that input dot question will return us a string. Sweet. Absolutely. Yeah, Hi. we can trust we can trust uh, data types being returned from functions always. They will not change their types on us, typically. I would say like ninety nine percent sure. <laughs> Nothing's ever 100%. Sorry, I think I cut somebody off. What? Uh, any other questions out there? Yeah, it was me. Like, um, can you please show us um, if the cabinet number is like not between zero and three, zero and four? Like, is it, yeah. it, it's like five or six or something like that? In that case, if we do that, oh, what's going to happen is that we're going to get a type error there. If we get outside of that index, what it's going to do is going to come down here and try to do the user cabinet selection on this dot includes, or sorry, it's gonna say, hey, I want you to grab the 100th index of the cargo hold here. Well, and then I want you to do a dot includes on it. Well, JavaScript's gonna be like, well, I tried to grab the 100 index of this cargo hold, but uh, there's nothing there. And then you're telling me to do this dot includes on nothing? Like, I'm sorry, but I can't help you out with that. And it breaks. That's what just happened. So to help us out with that, what we would need to do is some validation. So up here with this error, typically we would exit the application at that point. So to answer your question, Hannah, it would cause an error if we did that. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, absolutely. And a quick question. Um, yeah. It's just about like line 24. So the point of putting the number in there is because when, you, you know, the the person puts their like answer in there it's because it's a string is that why it needs to be a words to number maybe i'm overthinking it i don't know no i believe you're on the right track so remember input dot question returns us a string mm -hmm. so user cabinet selection on line 23 would be a string okay now take a look at line 27 we're saying is user cabinet less than or equal to cargo hold dot length now in math class, if, I, if your teacher asked you on a test that literally determined if you were going to fourth grade or not, <laughs> is cookie less than or equal to four, would you okay. get angry? Absolutely, because cookie <laughs> is a string. When it's returned here, input.question, it's a string. So what we need to do is convert it to a number. So when we come down here, we're safely comparing number to number. Oh, okay. So yes. it's more about safety there. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kyle. Absolutely, everyone. Thank Anybody you, else have any other final questions before we are done here? Because I believe if we look at our studio, that is all we got. So awesome. Thank you, Kyle. Absolutely, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording here.